Amen. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well. My name is Garrett McCord, and I'm the youth pastor here at FBC Bernie. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and warn you. Uh, I'm not going to probably be moving around up here on stage a whole lot this morning. Uh, I'm in a little bit of pain because I made a mistake this past weekend. I made a big mistake. I signed up for a race. Uh, And you might think, oh, you know, fun, like a nice little 5K, some turkey trot action. Uh, No, this was a trail run relay uh, called Ragnar, which funny enough is the noise I felt like making about three miles into the race. And it was at Flat Rock Ranch, which also funny enough is not flat. I don't know how it got that name, uh, but it's the complete opposite of flat. Uh, And so how this race works It's a team race. Each team has eight runners, and each runner individually has to run a three, a five, and a seven-mile loop. So for a team, yeah, I'm already hearing some people laughing. I I, I know, I know. Uh, Each team ends up having to run a total of 120 miles. And it starts at 11 a.m. on Friday. It ended at about 11 a.m. on Saturday. So it's about a 24-hour thing. And you think, oh, well, you know, you probably, like, trained for it, right? No, no, not at all, actually. I haven't run more than a mile in probably six months. It was, it was not well planned out. You think, oh, well, you're, you're young, right? Like, you do you, you fitness and stuff, right? Yeah, but I'm like 5'10", my feet are as flat as West Texas, and I have a bad back. So I really was not set up for success uh, with this run. But while the running was crazy, that's not actually what almost killed me. What actually literally almost killed me is that around 8.30, I was running my five-mile loop, and I was going with my friend Danny Phillips, and and he was running behind me. And um, so we were were running, and it's dark, so you're wearing a headlamp, uh, so you can only see so far in front of you. Uh, And then I got to a point where about two and a half feet in front of me, this little guy uh, was hanging out. Um, That's not a garden snake. Uh, That is a rattlesnake, and I about stepped on it, like literally probably from me to this plant, uh, and so my soul immediately left my body. (laughs) I hate snakes. I have nothing to do with them. Satan chose it for sin to enter in the world or whatever became it. I don't need it. I don't have any use for it. If you like them, cool. I'll pray for you. Have no use for them. And so I thought I was being chased because he was coiled up and then he uncoiled. So I took off into the bushes, right? Uh, Danny Phillips basically had to tackle me so I didn't run off a cliff uh, because we're like on a trail. There's this sharp drop off here. And so we're sitting there. He basically tackles me. We have to like start throwing rocks at it, which in hindsight was not the best way to handle the situation, to try and get it to move off the trail. Uh, But in that moment, my knees and my ankles were killing me. I was exhausted. Uh, I almost got deleted by a rattlesnake. I started to ask myself, how in the world did I end up here? Somebody who doesn't run, somebody who really doesn't have any use for running, how in the world did I end up on the side of this mountain running 15 miles in the middle of the night? I started to really rethink all of my life decisions and trace all of my bad decisions back to, oh yeah, I said yes, I got peer pressured. Uh, And so I just traced all that back. And I tell that story, why am I telling that story? Oh, it's a funny example, and and honestly, the race was a lot of fun with great people, but I tell it because there's a lot of times in life where we stop and we ask that same question. How in the world did I get here? And sometimes we we ask that question because we don't like where we're at in life. You look in the mirror and, and you don't like who you see. Your life's a mess. You look up from your marriage that's been in shambles for far longer than you would like to admit. And you can't help but wonder, how did I get from a honeymoon to what basically amounts to a cold business agreement for the sake of the kids? Or you look up from the sin that you thought you'd never commit, gone further than you ever thought you would go, and you wonder, how in the world did I get to a place where this was possible? You look up from addiction, crippling negativity, cynicism, greed, apathy, and wonder, how did I turn into this type of person? And better yet, how in the world do I begin to change? And the truth of the matter is, we all look up at times in our life and wonder, we realize, hey, I've gotten really far from God and really far from the person that he's called me to be, and I have no idea how to get back. I know, I know that I have. I've had those moments in life where I was like, man, how did I end up here? What happened? I thought I was doing good, and then something goes down, and all of a sudden, I'm like, man, what in the world? And so this morning, I would like us to look into Scripture and see what it has to say to this experience that so many of us have had, and some of us are in the middle of it right now this morning. How do we turn into the kind of person that we aren't proud of, and how do we get back? 
And so our text this morning is Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10. So if you want to go ahead and flip there, if you don't have a Bible, we have one in the pew back in front of you. That is our gift to you. We want you to have a copy of God's Word. We want you to be able to take that, mark it up, take it home. That's yours. And so funny enough, when Jason gave me this opportunity to preach this week, it was originally going to be a part of the Acts series. And it got shuffled around a little bit, and it turned into an open week. And I love open weeks because you really get to preach what the Lord has been teaching you and put on your heart. And so I've recently been walking through the book of Galatians, and I've loved it. And this topic is one that the Lord really kind of uh, laid on my heart and smacked me with, frankly. Uh, Like, this has beaten me up as I've wrestled through this text. And if you're not super familiar, the letter of Galatians primarily deals with uh, this group called Judaizers. They were basically Jewish people who came into the church in Galatia and were trying to convince the believers that they needed to keep the law in order to truly be Christian or or really to take the right of circumcision to really be accepted by God. And so Paul points out in the beginning of the book that, hey, you are justified by faith alone. You are saved by faith. Why return to something that didn't save you? Uh, and, And ultimately, while the law had a purpose, it wasn't God's ultimate plan for our salvation. His plan was Jesus. And through Jesus, we're no longer slaves to the law because he fulfilled it. But that then leads into the back half of the book where you get this discussion about how we should use that freedom specifically that it should not be a license to sin, to go and do whatever we want. And so in our text this morning, we reach the end of that where Paul gives a practical warning about, hey, why does any of this matter? Why am I talking about freedom? Why does it matter how you use your freedom? And specifically, we're going to see three things in this text. One, how you either become free or how you become enslaved. Two, the principle that lies underneath the text that we probably actually are a lot more familiar with than we realize And then three, the practical side of things. Hey, what does this actually look like in life? How do we live this out? And so let's go ahead and read, starting in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let's not become discouraged in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not become weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially to those who have the household of faith. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Um, I pray that even right now, God, as we wrestle with a text that honestly, God, can step on our toes, Uh, God, that can really point out some things in our life that we might not be aware of and that might be hurtful to you. And Lord, I pray that we would uh, be able to receive your conviction. We'd be able to receive your word with open hearts, open eyes, and open ears. So that as we leave here this morning, we would be changed. We would look more like you. That's our greatest desire. Would you be glorified this morning, God? We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so chances are you're probably fairly familiar with these verses. Anybody heard these verses before, read them a little bit? Yeah, and maybe if you're not familiar with the verses themselves, you're probably familiar with the term, you reap what you sow. Now, the thing about that is, and most people, I didn't even really realize this until recently, I think that's actually one of the more misunderstood concepts in all of Scripture. Because often when we think about reaping and sowing, we kind of think about it in terms of some sort of like, Christian karma or poetic justice of, oh, you need to be nice to people so they'll be nice to you or whatever. And in a much worse manner, a lot of times you'll hear this principle being preached as part of what we call the prosperity gospel. Uh, Pastors who fly around in private jets, wear designer clothes, and they tell their followers, man, if you would just simply sow a seed of faith, which is almost always a financial seed, but if you'll sow that seed, then all your problems will go away. And if they don't, you just didn't have enough faith. So sow another one with a bit more faith, and we'll keep trying until until I'm rich. And that's heresy. But to truly understand this passage and this principle, you have to look at the placement within the greater context of Galatians. And we already walked through this a little bit. In that first part, Paul's making the case that through Jesus' blood, the Galatians were set free from the law. They're no longer slaves to trying to keep up all the things of the law to be clean enough to approach God because Jesus made a way for them to approach God. They don't need to go back and receive circumcision. But in Galatians 5, this is the pivot point I, I referenced earlier. Galatians 5.13, Paul writes, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Which kind of throws us for a loop, because he talks about, hey, you're free. Except, this is how you should use that freedom. 
And what he's saying is just because you're free from the law doesn't mean you're free to go and sin and do whatever you want. And that's a really important point for us in the West and in America because we typically think about freedom as the ability to do whatever you want. You're free from any sort of external authority or authority figure telling you what to do. It's, it's my land, it's my property, it's my life. Who are you to tell me what to do with it? But realistically, in ancient times, freedom was not so much about being free from external authority, just to go do whatever you want. And a lot of that's caught up with they didn't view authority the way that we do. They didn't view it as negatively as we do. But they thought of freedom much more in the sense of having the freedom to do what is right and what is good. You're free to do what you should. And so without going on this long tangent, the point that Paul's making is that Christian freedom is not freedom from any sort of rules or standards, but freedom to please God, freedom to walk with the God who made you to walk with him. But back to Paul's argument, right after the command on freedom, he gets really practical and he gives examples of how your freedom should be used and how it shouldn't. And he lists out these deeds of the flesh and these fruits of the spirit. It's this long list, and ultimately that gets us to our passage now where he ends this train of thought with a warning about how somebody either experiences freedom in the Holy Spirit or becomes a slave to their flesh. It's a warning about how somebody becomes a certain kind of person, if you're tracking with me there. And in the warning, he says that everybody's doing one of two things. This is the text. He's either sowing to the flesh, and sowing is, is planting. That's, that's a term for planting. It's an ag- agrarian Uh, concept. You're either sowing to the flesh, and this means feeding our most carnal, sinful desires. And so he lists out these deeds of the flesh. Some are sexual immorality, impurity, uh, witchcraft, hostility, strife. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But Paul warns us that feeding that part of you, that part that that wants instant gratification, doesn't care what anybody else thinks, doesn't care what anybody else feels, but it makes me feel good, The more that you feed that part of you, the more it grows. What you feed grows. Think about it like an alcoholic who first chooses to drink seldomly and then chooses to drink often. And over time, that desire grows and they feel like they have to because the desire has grown so strong. And they no longer have a choice because they have to scratch that itch. And the biggest problem with that, or one of the big problems with that, is not only are you enslaved to whatever that vice is, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's greed, maybe it's comparison, I don't know, but not only you're enslaved to that, but you're enslaved to a type of selfishness because you're always going to pick your own desires, your own wants, your own needs over anybody else's because you're so used to doing that. And it really, it kills any sort of genuine selfless love that you'd like to show, whether it's in parenting, whether it's in marriage, whether it's just in friendships, That's sowing to the flesh. And then the second option is sowing to the Spirit. And this means feeding the Holy Spirit inside of you. If you're a believer, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's God's presence inside of us. And he lists off the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I have to sing it. I don't know why. I can't just like say them. And Paul says that sowing to the Spirit leads to eternal life. And we think of that as one day we get to be in heaven with God and all those sorts of things. And that is very true But eternal life is not just a then thing, it is also a now thing. When we are saved, our eternal life starts now, and that means a quality of life, a freedom in the Holy Spirit that's unlike anything else that this world has to offer. Because when you feed the Spirit, you grow into a person that's free, meaning that you're not mastered by lustful desires, you're not mastered by greed, trying to keep up with the Joneses, you're not mastered by being covetous and wanting what everybody else has. You're free to love well, parent well, Serve God well without the flesh getting in the way, demanding that you get yours and scratch that itch of self-gratification. And so you might be thinking, well, that seems a little black and white, don't you think? Like either freedom in the spirit or slavery to the flesh. Like, is it really that clean cut? And sure, there's some nuance there, but I think that Paul knows exactly what he's saying and why he's saying it. And I think it makes perfect sense when you realize that he is simply applying a principle that we all know, the principle of reaping and sowing, that got built into the universe in a spiritual way. And you're probably pretty familiar with this concept anyways, because in the secular world, you might hear it referred to as the law of returns. You hear it in statements like, you get what you pay for, you get back what you put in, you get uh, garbage in, garbage out, whatever you like to phrase it as, 
But it's not just a secular thing. Jesus actually touches on this as well when he says things like, hey, give and it will be given to you, or with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And one of my favorite authors, John Mark Comer, boils the principle down to two main parts. One, and this is the principle of reaping and sowing, the first part is that every cause has an effect. We know this, right? It's, it's in our physics, it's in our everything. That if you plant a rose seed, you're going to get a rose. But if you plant poison ivy, you're going to get poison ivy. Every cause has an effect. But then the second part is one we typically don't think about, and that's that the effect is often disproportionate to the cause. Or another way to put this, the cause is usually, or the effect is usually greater than the cause. So to, to make it really simple, you can plant a tiny little mustard seed, but you're going to grow a massive tree, right? The, the cause may have been that seed and the water and the sunlight, but what you get is so much more than what you initially planted. And Paul writes that way because he's talking to a culture that's very familiar with agriculture. He's very familiar with uh, crops, and, and most of these people farmed as a way to survive. In our culture, we might understand this principle a little bit more through something like compound interest. And so if you know anything about compound interest, the principle is that when you're saving for retirement or investing or whatever, even more so than what you put into that account, what's important is starting early. Because if you see, I actually have like a graph up here where you can see, uh, with that graph, when you start saving or you start putting away to something, it starts out as just a little bit, right? And as you just keep being consistent and consistent and consistent and putting money into that account, over time, the first like 10 or 15, 20 years, that doesn't seem like much, but over time it starts to grow. And then right around your 50s, the balance just explodes, right? When I was looking through this, when I was first thinking about, hey, how do I save for retirement? Like your eyes pop when you realize what it can be at the end of your life, even though it's just $100 a month or whatever. And so I say that to say, hey, you know, that's a financial principle. But in the same way, a choice to feed bitterness or kindness might not feel like much at the beginning, it might not feel like you're, you're contributing a whole lot to your overall life, but over time, those choices stack up, and they start to snowball. And your trajectory towards either kindness or bitterness starts to accelerate the more and more choices that you stack up, the more and more you sow to that thing. And so the point is, while this is a financial principle, this law of returns, reaping and sowing, whatever you want to call it, is a universal reality. It's how the world works. And so what Paul's doing in this passage is he's taking this principle that God has built into the universe and he's applying it to our spiritual formation, which is the way that we are being shaped into a certain type of person later on. We're either being shaped into somebody who loves God and is near to God or somebody who is far from God. And so to go back to earlier, if you sow to the flesh, if you feed those desires, those lustful desires, those desires to have more money, those desires to be uh, thought of well, pride, whatever it is, as you feed that thing, it starts to grow inside of you. It starts to become more and more of who you are, and you start to become a slave to it. But if you sow to the Spirit, Christ-like character begins to grow up and take root, and over time, it starts to become who you are. And so you see that, that who we are at the end of our life is actually the product of a trajectory that starts much, much earlier. And guess what? Science and psychology are actually starting to back this up. A lot of psychology has been focused on thought life and thought patterns, and we now know that when we think or when we have a thought, we, have a, uh, we do a new thing, we get this thing called a neuron in our mind, and, and this is what it looks like. And that neuron, we can think of it like a thought pathway. And so think about how a pathway, when you first start to walk on it, it's new, it's kind of hard to follow, but the more and more that you walk on that path, the more well-worn it becomes. The more uh, you can easily see it, the more you can follow it, the more well-traveled, it's, it's wider. And in the same way, the more that we think of a thought or perform an action, that pathway grows. It grows branches, it grows more familiar to us, and in fact, there's a certain point where it starts to become encoded in the part of your brain that controls habits and muscle memory. And so all that to say, the thoughts that you think literally become wired into your brain. It's a part of you. And on one side of things, it can be helpful because we can teach our minds to go about life in a good, positive, healthy way, and it kind of like starts to take us that direction, or it can be negative. This is why it can be so hard to stop sinning or to break bad habits because we create these pathways in our minds that become muscle memory. So let's forget all the science and psychology. Really practically, what does this look like? Well, say somebody's stressed. Right? Think about what you do when you're stressed. A lot of, uh, a lot of people go and they go to social media, 
right? We click on Instagram, start scrolling because it's a distraction. So you can forget about those feelings you don't want to feel. And I'm just going to scroll and I'm going to do this. And you know, that's, that's fine once or twice, no big deal. But the more it happens, the more the mind is conditioned to, hey, that's going to be my response to stress. When I'm stressed, when I'm feeling uncomfortable, I'm going to turn to Instagram. And if you want to test it, go ahead and delete Instagram, Facebook, whatever your social media app is of choice. Delete that from your phone and see how many times you click on that folder just mindlessly, like, oh, click, click, oh, it's not there anymore. It'll really humble you. And so substitute Instagram for something more serious like alcohol, a certain type of video on the internet, a certain type of way of spending your money, and you can start to see how Paul had it right thousands of years ago. Sowing to the flesh leads to slavery to the flesh, and slavery to the flesh will ultimately lead to making a mess of your life. And that point is why this discussion in this text matters so much, because this isn't, I'm not up here giving a TED talk, I'm not up here, I wrestled with this because I didn't want it to come across, like I'm trying to, uh, you know, tell you how to have good habits and how to make your New Year's resolutions last longer and how if you start your day with a cold shower and and coffee with butter in it, then everything's going to be okay and you'll be invincible. That's not the goal here. If you want that, you can open one of probably a thousand books at Barnes and Noble. They all tell you that. This is not so much about habits, but it's about the person you are becoming right now. James Clear says it this way, that your habits become you. Or to quote Comer again, and I know, I promise one day I'll stop quoting him. The things we do, do something to us. And there's a theologian named um, Plantinga who puts it this way. He kind of sums it all up together, and, and he tracks how this process works. And he says that if you plant a thought, you'll reap an action. And if you plant an action, you'll reap another action. And if you plant some action, you'll reap a habit. And you plant some habits, you'll reap a character. And as you plant a character, you'll reap two thoughts. And those thoughts then pursue careers of their own. And so you see how this process becomes this cyclical thing that can start to speed up the more and more you feed into it, either for good or for bad. And how what can start as a thought becomes so much more. And so to bring us full circle back to our opening illustration, how do I get here? How did I become this type of person? How did I make such a mess in my life? What happens slowly? It starts small. And it happens over time. And eventually, you can reach a place where you're totally different than who you were when you started. You turn into somebody that you don't want to be by a million little choices. Take the age-old example of an affair. You know, nobody really wakes up one morning and says, you know what, I think I'm going to cheat on my spouse. Like, that's not just something you wake up and do. That starts years and years and years before. It's the product of a, ta- a thousand tiny choices that shape you into somebody who would be capable of that. It's sowing to the flesh by letting thoughts of discontentment fester. Oh, I'm really not happy. She really doesn't meet my needs. She's really not doing this or that or the other. And then it's the eyes that start to wander, the thoughts that inevitably follow, the online browsing habits, the skipping of date night, the spending more time away, the not-so-innocent flirting, and it snowballs and see the affair was not the product of a decision one day, but it was a product of a character that came with thousands of choices. Thousands of thoughts that you gave real estate in your mind and in your heart and in your life, in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. And the point is, this is what I'm, all this psychology, all this stuff, I know there's been a lot of dense information, but all of it is just trying to get you to see that we have to be mindful of what we sow. We have to think about what we're thinking about because right now, you are becoming someone, whether you like it or not. And I see all this time in youth ministry where students think that they're going to be the exception, right? They live the first portion of their life sowing to the flesh, going to parties, uh, doing whatever they want. It's like, yeah, no, I'm just sowing my wild oats now, and then I'll go to college, I'll have a lot of fun. And then, you know, around like age 28, 29, 30, 35, right? Then I'll get married and settle down, nice little house, white picket fence, we'll go to church, and everything will be great. But you know what happens 99% of the time? Maybe that's a stretch, but what happens the majority of the time is that student goes and lives life however they want to, and what happens is they start to develop much more of a taste for the world than for God. And they they start to develop such a taste for the world that they don't 
They don't want to turn around. They become a person who doesn't desire God, who doesn't desire the things of God, who doesn't desire any of that, and they never come back because they planted all of these seeds to someone that they really didn't necessarily want to be, and they thought they were going to outrun it. And so my point here is, is we are not the exception. We have to pay attention to what we're paying attention to. I'm begging you to see that, that you might escape the immediate consequences to your actions and your decisions, but they are still shaping you. Uh, I, I heard a really powerful example of Matt Chandler who said it this way, Satan might be setting a trap in your life right now that's not gonna stop for another 20 years, but when it does, it'll take everything down. But the principle goes both ways. It's not just about becoming someone who you don't want to be, but it's about becoming the person who God calls you to be, the person who as Christians we should desire to be. If you become enslaved to your flesh by a million little choices, you grow in freedom in the same way. And I think the best example that I can think of of somebody who is sown to the Spirit is one of Christine's uncles. His name is Michael. Uh, he has nine children, which I think that alone accounts for a lot of the Christ-like character. Like, I don't know that you can get to that point without being sanctified some. Because uh, I've got one, and it beats me up on the daily of how selfish I am and how much I need God. Uh, so multiply that by nine, and you're basically a saint, right? But he's just one of those people who loves Jesus. He follows Jesus every single day, and he had a testimony where he was once far from God, enslaved to addiction, enslaved to all sorts of chains and things. Uh, but he found Jesus, or God found him, and he drew him near. And ever since then, all he has done is sought to follow Jesus the best that he possibly could for the rest of his life. And every day he has these practices that draw him near to Jesus. He's very mindful of how he spends his time, what he allows into his mind, and he sows to the Spirit. And it shows in the type of person that he is now. And it shows so clearly when a couple years back he dealt with a stage three cancer diagnosis that honestly we didn't know if it was going to take him or not. And there was another family tragedy that um, was probably of even harder magnitude to deal with that happened shortly after that. But in the middle of the dark night of the soul, like the worst place that you could probably put somebody, in the middle of a place that would bring me to my knees, you couldn't get the dude to say a negative thing. It was pure joy, it was pure peace. Understanding that God's will be done, he's in control. How in the world can you become that type of person? Like we all wanna be that type of person, but how do you actually become that type of person? I'll tell you, it's not just by waking up one day and deciding to be that type of person. It's by sowing to the Spirit. Because Michael, he was free in the Spirit. He had sown, he had drawn close to God, he had built up this Christ-like character over just a million little decisions every day to wake up and read the Scripture, to pray, to spend time in silence and listen for God to speak. All those things over years and years and years got him to that place where he was free from having his emotional state dictated by the circumstances of life. He was free from having to have things go a certain way in his life for him to have joy. And doesn't that sound wonderful? Like, don't we all like that? Like, don't we all desire to be free from the circumstances of life, to be unchained from the way that things go? that constant background anxiety that's just running of, oh man, what if something happens? Like, I know I've gone through life just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, yeah, things are great right now, but what if they don't? What if something happens? What if I lose somebody? And to be free from that, like we deeply desire that. And Michael was, because once he met Jesus, he spent his entire life sowing to the spirit, cultivating the fruits, love, joy, peace, patience. And so the whole point that I'm trying to make this morning is that what you think, say, do, listen to, the people that you spend time with, all of that shapes you. Every moment of every day, you are becoming someone. And the thoughts that you let grow and the decisions that you make shape the person that that will be. Either one who's dominated by the flesh, by sin, greed, lust, negativity, apathy, and ultimately that path leads to ruin, or one who is free in the spirit to live like Jesus, to love well, to serve well, to parent well. Something I would, I would hope as believers or those of us in the room who are believers deeply desire. And so the question I wanna ask you this morning, or actually I want you to ask yourself, what are you sowing to? Who are you becoming? 
If your life stayed on the trajectory that it is currently on, where does that road lead? Are you sowing to love or hate? Joy or bitterness? Self-control or lust? Kindness or anger? And be really honest with yourself because it's a very important question to know the answer to. And I'll, I'll be honest, one of the things I know that I struggle with sowing to is a critical nature. I, I can be a very critical person and the worst, nastiest part of that is the ones who I love have to face it the most. I'm not critical of people I don't know, but the people who care about me. And I know that if I start to sow to the flesh by choosing to assume the worst, talk down about somebody, think negatively about them, start to point out their flaws, it grows until I just have this disposition of criticalness about me. And that's not a fun Garrick to be around. But I just wanna end and I wanna say that I don't think the heart of this passage is to leave you terrified of one stray thought destroying your marriage, right? We do have intrusive thoughts. We have things that we have to rein in and there's grace and there's mercy. I do think it's that we need to be realistic and realize that you're not gonna outrun a life full of poor decisions. You're not gonna get something out that you didn't put in. But more than that, this text should cause you to fall in love with the promise of eternal life that starts now. It should take a weight off your shoulders because you can know that ultimately the Holy Spirit is the one that changes you, right? Nowhere in this text does Paul say, hey, you need to work really hard. You need to try and measure up. You need to ship up or uh, shape up or ship out. Like you need to get everything together and then maybe you'll be good enough to earn God's love. No, it says sow to the Spirit. What does it mean to sow to the Spirit? Scripture says draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. See, we do have a responsibility to draw near to God but he's the one who changes us. He's the one who shapes us. He's the one who cleans us up from the inside out. It's God all through and through. And that takes a weight off my shoulder of, hey, you know, I'm not worried if I don't read enough self-help books and if I don't do enough this and if I don't do enough that, it's like, hey, I'm just gonna try and put myself before God as much as I possibly can in my life. And I know that he's gonna take care of the rest. And so I just wanna encourage you at the end this morning as we close, Maybe this morning, you're here and you look up from your life and you realize that you are far from the person that God has called you to be. You're not where you wanna be right now. If you're honest, you've made a mess of your life and you have no idea where to go from here. Well, let me tell you, first and foremost, you're in the right place this morning. Today can be the day of repentance. Maybe for the first time, maybe, maybe you don't know Jesus. You say, I can't sow the spirit because I don't have him. You can get him today. Come on front when we do our, our invitation and I would be more than happy to guide you through that process. Or maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time, but you realize that you haven't actually been making the decisions that look like following him. But 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you can find eternal life today. And so as the band comes up and we work towards a close, I just want you to, to be, like, be encouraged knowing that you can draw near to God in this moment, in his word, through prayer, and the spiritual discipline, Sabbath, silence, solitude, gratitude, worship. And look, your, your life might not look a whole lot different tomorrow, but you can rest knowing that God is faithful. And that's the beauty of how our text ends this morning. Verse nine, let us not become discouraged in doing good for in due time we will reap. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much this morning for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together, that, that we have to just wrestle with this text, God. And I pray that you would just help us to see that Lord, we are making decisions and thinking thoughts and doing things that shape who we're gonna become. And Lord, I pray that as we wrestle with this text, we be able to really think about God, who is that person? Who am I becoming? What, what am I doing that's gonna put me on a trajectory or a path? Not so that we can feel good about ourselves, God, not so that we can uh, be this example of great character, but Lord, we just wanna be near to you. And so in this moment, this morning, would you point out anything in our heart and our minds and our souls that would take us further away from that? God, would you convict us? Would you draw us near? Would you set us on the path that leads to eternal life? 
would you give us the honesty to, to wrestle with those things that are in our hearts and in our lives? And Lord, if there's anybody who needs to confess sin, if there's anybody who needs to get right before you, God, I pray that they would do that in this moment, that they wouldn't put it off, that they would completely, God, as you say, Lord, to repent and to follow you and that they would begin to experience eternal life and the joy, the love, the peace, the patience, and the kindness that can only come from the Holy Spirit inside of us. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and respond?